You're listening to a Her Campus podcast based out of the University of Victoria. I'm your host, Kate Harder, and today on the show, I have a few members of the Her Campus UVic team to discuss a topic that I think has been all of our minds while in the midst of midterms, mental health. So I'm going to open it up now to the lovely people I have with me right now to introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Carly. I'm a fourth year student in creative writing. Um, and I've been with her campus for three years now, and I just stepped into the role of vice president. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm in my second year of creative writing and my second year with her campus. Hi, I'm Tony. I've been with her campus for three years now. I am a writing graduate and a prospective law student. Cool. And I guess I'll just say that I am in my fourth year here at UVic, and I guess it's my fourth year with her campus as well. So for me, I guess when I was writing this podcast, I was thinking about how the end of October into November is always just sort of this doom and gloom time of year where you sort of have this very gray, drizzly sky that is setting in and you sort of feel like October was some glorious thing that was just imagined while you were falling asleep amongst studying for your million midterms or writing a million papers. Uh, and so I'm a really big fan of metaphors. I don't know about you guys, but of course, I, I here. <laughs> love metaphors. Uh, so I like to conjure up this image of the last stretch until exam period as being this mental equivalent of a slog through chest deep water in which you never <laughs> feel like you can quite get enough footing to propel yourself forward and out of the waves. But nevertheless, you still are moving. You're not drowning. You're just very slowly almost dying almost dying wow beautiful <laughs> beautiful um but oh, let's push the metaphors aside uh because really this time of year is difficult and for a lot of students mental health is going to be a huge topic of discussion uh and so even if you're a season pro a few of us were all fourth third years graduated second years or if it's your first year uh, of university, mental health is really going to be something that you have to be cognizant of. And so I know just within our discussions at her campus, mental health often comes up as this huge buzzword. And along with that, there's a lot of buzzwords like treat yourself or practice self care. Uh, and I know personally, I can feel like these are these sort of bubble bath or these chocolate bar solutions that really make light of this, what is a very serious topic. Um, and I know when we were talking and sort of doing this writing and this creating process, we realized that, you know, because of all of this discussion around mental health, this is being brought to the forefront, mental health, the stigmas around mental health are sort of being broken down, but there's definitely a lot that still needs to be done. Uh, so I believe that Tony, um, is here and he, uh, they are going to contribute a little bit, uh, <laughs> Yeah, what they've found just researching mental health. Um, well, I just pulled some quick uh, numbers and information from the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association website. Uh, that's very easy to access for anybody who wants to follow up and read more. Uh, it was a quick Google search away. Um, so according to the CMHA, one in five Canadians will deal with mental illness at some point in their lives. Uh, and suicide accounts for a quarter of the deaths for people aged 15 to 24. Mm -hmm. uh, and the statistic is a little bit less um, for people older than that. I believe the number was uh, 10%, but that's still staggering. And uh, they didn't have a further breakdown as to how things like um, income or race or sex or gender impact that, but uh, I think we can all generally agree here and use the framework, it does. It makes an impact. Mm -hmm. um, some people are going to have to deal with things that other people will not. Um, and mental health is definitely one of those things and is also uh, a symptom of one of those things. Uh, it's kind of an Ouroboros feeding into each other situation. Um, so and because of the uh, negative stigma associated with having mental health conditions, um, people can 
trivialize or belittle you. Uh, you can have trouble holding down a job or finding a place to live. Uh, you can have trouble maintaining relationships because people don't understand or don't want to understand what's going on. Um, so I think uh, kind of talking about what uh, Kate mentioned as well, um, the fact that we do we do throw around some like feel good care words. We do like self care is a very broad term for like, no, just give yourself a bubble bath, have a night in, <laughs> relax, pour some, pour some wine for yourself. Uh, and it's this very glamorized, romanticized image of taking care of yourself, but you don't see as many people take a positive view of, um, so some people need a medication. They need proper, chemicals in their brain that their body is not creating. Uh, sometimes that means seeing a counselor, or sometimes it means seeing a psychiatrist. Um, and there's a lot more openness about people talking about dealing with depression or anxiety, and a lot less for people who are dealing with borderline personality disorder or schizophrenia or any of the less glamorized mental health issues, things that are still being actively researched today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I may, to speak a bit about um, kind of the, the whole um, buzzword of um, self-care being made into kind of this synonym of taking a bath or bath time or whatever, I can definitely say that um, the transition for me into un university, it was like a little, it was definitely a bit overwhelming. And um, I remember adults and profs and everyone saying, okay, the first year is going to be a tough transition period. And, you know, self-care, self-care, self-care. And I definitely thought bubble bath, bubble bath, bubble bath. Yeah. And I remember having this moment where I thought, I don't, I don't even think we had baths and residence. I think it was just having a shower. But I remember taking a shower and thinking to myself, I'm still not calm. Like, I'm still anxious. Yep. And then it was like this aha moment, as Oprah would say, of, of going, wait a second, it's not about the bath or the shower or the workout or any of those things. It's how you do them and how they make you feel. Because if that bath is just, it's not working for you, maybe that's not what you need. And how that, um, how self-care can be very individual it's not a one-size-fits-all like uh, just as valuable like thing to do for self-care could be yeah doing that stack of dishes that's on the counter that's been staring at you for a week or it could be finishing the assignment that's been niggling at the back of your head for way too long it could be uh, small productive things like that it could be canceling plans because you just cannot go out mm -hmm. um, and it yeah. can also be indulging in plans. Mm, that's you know, it's totally as, it's self care is as much indulgence as it is not indulging mm -hmm. in something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think with that word indulgence, you have to be careful because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will use it in sort of a negative oh, you're being so selfish, indulging in that kind of a way. Mm -hmm. You're being hedonistic mm -hmm. or luxurious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas it's like, well, hang on a second. Like I'm allowed to give myself some time or like I control every other aspect of my life to a T. I'm allowed to eat some goddamn chocolate cake <laughs> and not feel bad about it yeah. and let it make me a little bit happier. Or indulgence could also be I'm going to um, indulge in going for a walk and giving myself space, like social space from others. Or it could mean I'm going to indulge and go spend time with my friends because I do need social time and I feel a little bit isolated right now. Um, yeah, it's sort of like checking in with your, is it is the word like barometer? Like, is that kind I of the metaphor so. that you yeah, use? Sort of like your personal dial, dial mental health barometer. Yeah, it's kind of like Wait, checking in with that and seeing where you're at. Do I need more social time? Do I need less? Um, yeah, yeah, that's totally true. And I mean, then just sort of spitballing away from that a little bit, I mean, and going back to universities, mm -hmm. we've all experienced that, the profs saying, oh, like mental health 
be cognizant of it, make sure you're checking in for yourself and doing what you need. Um, but sometimes, as we were saying, we don't really know what we need and accessing the different resources can be really tricky. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that I think if you've decided that, you know, or if you've tried different things like hanging out with friends or talking with your peers and you've decided that you need something more, like mm -hmm. you actually need to talk to a professional or a trusted adult about it, I think that's where we get a little caught up and almost on the stigma, but then not even the stigma. So you might be able to leap that sort of hurdle of, I need to talk to a therapist, but then where do you even go to talk to a therapist? I think that's a good segue to talk about UVix counseling services. Uh, so I did a quick search. Uh, the UVic counseling team is 18 people, not counting the two executives at the top, who may or may not actually provide some counseling services. Mm. I'm not certain on that. So allow for a plus minus two here. I'm going to go with minus for my numbers. Um, there are six people who are either interns or doing practicum. There are two specifically for indigenous students, one specifically for law students eight counselors, and one psychiatrist. With all of that, there are 21,700 students who are considered undergrad or graduate at the University of Victoria as of this recording, as of uh, the recent number taken this year in 2018. So uh, go back to uh, what I believe I said earlier, one in five Canadians will deal with mental illness. Let's take that, apply it to the number of students at UVic. So that gives us 4,340 people at the University of Victoria who are struggling with some kind of mental illness, allowing for a margin of error, obviously. But that means we have 18 people to help 4,340 people with their various mental illnesses. That could be depression, it could be PTSD, it could be anxiety, it could be any of these things. I don't think that's enough. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, especially if you consider the fact that it's not just people with mental illness going to counselors, there's also just first years who don't really know how to organize their time yet and don't know what, the, what they want to do with their life, who also go to those services. So it's probably an even greater, like, divide, like there, there's probably even more people without access. And there's also going to be plenty of people who do have mental illness who think, um, either because of the stigma, I don't want to be labeled as one of those crazy people, or because they've tried to go to a counselor in the past and they've been turned away because they can't get in. Because let's face it, there's only so many hours in the day that they can offer those services, especially with that few of people available. Yeah. What I find difficult because of those numbers with the UVic counseling services is that it's not necessarily realistic that I found to have a regular set schedule, a regular set meeting time mm -hmm. with a UVic counselor. So when it's not regular, that means that you might have to kind of wait around for an opening or it's just a little bit unpredictable. And I think that especially if you're dealing with something uh, like anxiety or something to, to that, um, that might not ease your anxiety, but sort of uh, egg it on and put more on your shoulders, that uncertainty, um, especially when there's so much uncertainty as a student already, like, am I going to get these grades? Am I going to have enough money? Am I going to, you know, get that job that I need to support myself? There's mm -hmm. so much uncertainty I already, and so to have that irre irregularity is um, another kind of stress for students absolutely yeah for sure and then that also sort of brings in the question I mean when I was doing a bit of research about this I read an interesting McLean's article uh, that was sort of brought up this point of universities clearly there's they're lacking the resources uh, but sort of to what extent then do universities need to be acting not only as an institution for education but then as an institution, a sort of uh, mental health or at a, at a larger, broader sense, a medical institution mm -hmm. um, or a healthcare institution, I guess, like a sort of pseudo healthcare institution, because 
I mean, we have the campus clinic, which is great, and I've accessed it before, and I've had nothing but good reviews from the doctors and the nurses at the, the campus, like, medical clinic. Um, but I thought it just kind of brought up an interesting idea of, okay, it is this, this, this educational and research institute that now is being expected to provide a sort of pseudo healthcare role as well. Um, I think that it's a weird way of phrasing it, but investing in people's health also invests in pe- people's success in their careers. Um, more healthy people results in uh, more efficient workers, more productive workers, uh, uh, workers who just excel at whatever they choose to do. So it's a weird thing to look at it from that business perspective and say it sort of pays back and it's an investment and it's worth your time and money. But I think when you're dealing with um, a university, which at the end of the day is a business, that's one way to present it to those people who are high up. I actually had a conversation with uh, my dad a while ago. Um, He uh, back, I guess, like 20 some years ago, uh, went to medical school. And he talks a lot about that experience because to him, he said it was like university, but turned up like several notches. It was, there was a lot of um, people who were struggling with their mental health and weren't receiving the support. And it was expected that in medical school, that's just the price you pay, it's that rigor. and. Um, and so, and that was hard not only for him, but to, to watch all his friends experience that. And he's always said, I never understood that because if you invested in people's health, look, like you would have so many more doctors. We wouldn't have this, um, we wouldn't have so few doctors and look how many more lives we could be saving. So to look at it from that perspective, perspective and to hear his um, experience in that really um, um, makes me think a lot about universities as a whole. Yeah, that's totally true. Mm-hmm. Well, I say Tony. Um, I, well, I mean, I was just hearing that breakdown, I think it's really apropos to describe it in terms of a business because I actually think that's like a major factor for, first off, a way to potentially influence change uh, on a government level if they. Uh, provided some kind of like tax incentive for universities to like provide greater mental health resources to students Um, that could be something because then they actually have a monetary reason to do it because at the end of the day I feel like they are more likely to make a decision that will benefit them in terms of money than they are for the ethical benefits to students Mm -hmm. and I think that's a really pessimistic way of looking at it but I can't help but look at it that way because we have this, I'm going to get a little bit Marxist here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we, we North, especially in North America, not just North America, but especially in North America, we have a capitalist system where like, I know that I was definitely brought up to like, if you work so hard that you're never sleeping and you're not eating properly. And that just means that you're like, a, that just means that you have something to be proud of because you're working so hard, because you're excelling so much and putting so much of yourself into the things that you're doing. And it's like, that's a belief that became popularized uh, uh, post-industrial revolution when people were put into factories and not paid enough to live and children were dying of all kinds of uh, different exposure and and that's something that still, to this day, has not ever really gone away. We still have that mentality of, you just need to work a little bit harder. That, like what you mentioned with your dad, it's worth it for the result. And yeah. that can be a really toxic mindset to shake, I think. That's true. Yeah. Well, definitely because at what point does it stop, right? At what point do you give yourself that break? Mm-hmm. to recover because otherwise I mean I've definitely experienced at university we probably all have where you work and work and work and then you burn out and I think especially at this time of year I mean you just look around at how many people in the library are coughing and are sick um, and I'm not saying that's a direct relation of them working super super hard but when you are really tired and you're overworking 
um, you're more susceptible to you're getting sick. Yeah. And like if you're not eating, because I know I'm super bad about that, I'll mm-hmm. just work and work and work and work and then not eat the food that I should be eating mm-hmm. to keep my body healthy. Um, but I think you brought up an interesting point about, well, both of you about this idea that the busier you are somehow equates to the better you are. And I almost wonder that if the universities could somehow, I mean, it would be hard because, I mean, that's sort of what their institution is tied up in. But if they could somehow break down that idea and almost rather than, I mean, what do I want to say? So if they can't provide more uh, sort of standard care, is there a way that they can just sort of tell students that it's okay for you to not take five or six classes a semester. It's okay for you to not get A's in all of your classes. Uh, Because I know some of the professors that I've really appreciated are the ones that have said, it's okay if on this midterm you only got a 70 because that's where you should be at. Um, I think one thing that as a whole, profs, parents, friends, everyone, I think we need to stop idealizing what I would call the short-term student, the person who does everything in a very short amount of time and then burns out. Instead, we need to uh, really celebrate the long-term students, the people who take their time, have balance, take care of their health. Because at the end of the day, you'll last longer. I don't know like (laughs) what I'm like in terms of last longer that necessarily means, but. Um, it might mean that you have a longer career or you just feel happier each day about what you're doing and feel more um, fulfilled by it, you know? I, so I think it's that mindset that all of us students, teachers, I don't know where it starts, but that hopefully we can change everyone's mind around that. Well, I think um, that kind of just reminds me a bit of uh, what's going on kind of in more elementary school and middle schools right now. My mom's a middle school teacher, so we talk about this, but there is kind of a shift right now of trying to get away from percentages and grades even altogether, which I know is like kind of impossible to implement in a university environment at this point. But I think that the idea of early on showing kids that it's about learning and improving instead of like just getting a 90 percent is probably gonna help them going into university a lot more to be more secure and understand what education is about i i believe it starts early yeah i think like we like three of us are in or were in the writing department Mm -hmm. and I, I had multiple professors and instructors who like told me straight up, it's kind of silly to grade this, like yeah. to apply a percentage of how good this story is or this essay is or this poem is because, I mean, the approach that I've definitely taken to that kind of thing is does it succeed at doing the thing it wants to do or doesn't it? It's a very like, and you can look at ways that it could do something better or something wor- worse, but it's really... The way it's done right now, it is hard not to associate self-worth with that achievement yeah. because mm-hmm. that is a direct measurement or it can seem like it's a direct measurement of your quality and of the energy that you have invested in this thing. Like, while I was still doing my undergrad, I was for a while full-time classes and had anywhere from two to five part-time jobs and I had all of the extracurricular stuff. I had HC, I had the hula hoop club, I had the medieval club, um, a bunch of other stuff that I did not have time to actually attend because I was doing so much. Um, And a bunch of people would tell me like, oh my god, it's so impressive that you can do that much. You're so impressive. And it's like, yeah, and I want to die. I think... I was definitely feeling that. I mean, even coming here today to write, to record this <laughs> podcast, I was like, I have signed up for way too many things this semester. And I mean, I tried hard not to, but I think part of it was it's sort of presented as if you do A and succeed at A, then you will be able to achieve B. 
And if you don't do A and you don't succeed at A, then there's no possible way you could ever get to B. Mm. And so I think that there's, I don't know, it just creates this very like toxic idea of, oh, I have to volunteer and I have to do all of this. And it just gets so stressful. And I know I kind of reached the point today where I was like, I'm not actually enjoying anything that I'm doing Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it just all feels like work or a responsibility Mm -hmm. and not a creative outlet of any kind. I like speaking as someone who's like come out the other side of that right now. uh, I've treated everything from like high school onwards as a resume builder. Every extracurricular, every club, all the volunteering, everything is like, yes, I want to do a good thing, but also, hey, I can justify it because it looks good on a resume. They don't, no one cares about your resume. No one cares about any of that stuff. And I was job hunting for like a year and a half before I finally got the cafe job that I'm at right now. And it's fine, it's a good job. But like, there isn't going to be this sudden moment after you graduate where people are like, hey, here's your reward. No, you keep working after that. It doesn't mm-hmm. stop. And you, it's even harder, frankly, because you need to know which, you don't have the direction that you had during school. And that could maybe be easier for some people depending on what they're studying. Maybe they've had the chance to do a practicum and can get in at a different organization and can start their career that they've been working towards really easily, but that isn't guaranteed for a lot of students. And that sounds really scary, but that doesn't have to be because we can talk about it and we can support each other and find ways of breaking down that system. Yeah. Um, I definitely grew up in an environment where being a workaholic, per se, was romanticized. Mm -hmm. And it was the be-all and end-all. But what I've learned from kind of keep pushing and pushing and pushing and really just burning out a lot in university, because at a certain point you just, you can't do it, you're human. what I've learned is that uh, my self-care word is no. <laughs> yes. And that no is such a strong and respected response. And more so than just saying no, saying no and leaving it at that. Not having to come up with an excuse. Mm-hmm. No, I really want to, but uh, my dog is sick and that's why. Like, n- no is okay. No is enough. Um, and so... I, I don't know at what point in university I got there. Um, probably in second year, I was I was uh, working as a community leader, so in residence. Um, I was taking five courses. I was in a club, and uh, you know I was just running around and being social and active, and and it was just too much. And mm-hmm. I've never felt more empowered than saying no. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that was, and that was great. And I was still, when I said no to things, what I realized is that I was able to invest more time in those fewer things. And I still, you know, in five months time accomplished and did all the things I wanted to, but I didn't squish it into like in a time crunch. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do it all every single day. Absolutely. I could prioritize and that was just fine. I mean, I love that word. <laughs> no, it's great. It's like my new favorite word. That's oh, totally. A quote of the week. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you if you guys are okay, I'd kind of like to wrap around to like maybe our experiences with mm-hmm. the UVic counseling services and yeah, totally how fulfilling they have been for us. Absolutely. Yeah, we can bring it back a little bit to campus and we steered off topic a little it was a good but, tangent uh, yeah <laughs> of course. but we'll bring it back yeah um so i during my degree i did have the chance to go to see counseling services on a couple of different occasions for a couple of different things and at first they were really it was pretty good i saw the same guy consistently two or three times um it was fairly light but it gave me a chance to talk about a lot of the stuff that I had going on and to kind of just release some of that frustration, which I realized basically walking out after each meeting was so essential. Mm -hmm. And then I had a lot of 
really heavy stuff happen. I've written about it for UVic in the past. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm pretty fine talking about it, but I was being uh, sexually harassed by someone else on campus for a very long time. Uh, and it got to the point where I couldn't go to classes regularly. I had to stop doing a lot of assignments. I like I went to my professors individually and spoke to them and explained I have this thing going on and I, I can't be here. Like I would have panic attacks even being on campus. And I tried to make an appointment to see one of the counselors at the UVic Counseling Services and I saw one of the students doing a practicum. And as soon as I started explaining what was going on to her, I could see from the look on her face that she was completely out of her depth and she was mm -hmm. not ready to deal with this because I was unpacking some pretty serious sexualized trauma and PTSD and social anxiety and all of these like very heavy things that I'd been holding on to for so long and at least at that point she was not properly equipped to be helpful for what I needed mm -hmm. and I don't think it's fair to hold that against her because uh, I think the reason I wanted to bring that up is because um, we have 18 counselors. Yeah. They can't possibly be ready to uh, help every student who comes with every problem because that is just the nature of things. There's so many different problems they can have. Um, the emotional toll of hearing so many people dredge up like their deepest, darkest fears and insecurities and every horrible thing that's happened to them that's got to take a toll on the counselor. At some mm -hmm. point, they're yeah. going to need counselors to deal with the things that they have heard and experienced. And I, I don't really know what the solution is uh, in that regard. But, um, yeah. Go. So do you think, I mean, I was just thinking a little bit, I had done a bit of research on the other mental health services that UVic provides. Oh, that's a great uh, idea. And the Student Union Building actually has just recently opened up a peer like welcome center or a peer mm -hmm. counseling service mm -hmm. which obviously for more sort of complex problems you're not going to want to go to a peer counseling service but maybe if you're that first year student that is just like you know I'm just not loving university right now everyone says it's supposed to be the most fun time and I'm just not having that much fun uh, the peer services can be good and I mean I don't I'm hesitant to say that because I don't want to tear things off as this is like this is like a baby mental health problem and this is like a slightly more major one so like the major ones go here and the minor ones go here because I don't want to do that but I think I don't really know I just I think I think it's good to to also show people that there's other resources as well and I think um from my experience, what I've learned is that um, it's okay to go to different counselors or different resources for different uh, issues that arrive in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I think whenever I was kind of presented with what it means to go to a counselor, it was like you match up with this counselor almost like you're dating you like you find your match and then you just stick with that counselor and that's mm -hmm. it and you're committed and um if that's not the case for you um and you know it's okay if you go irregularly to a counselor it's okay if you go regularly to a counselor it's mm -hmm. okay if uh for some things you confide in a friend and for some things you confide in someone who has a medical background. Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, I think that's, I think that's great, Kate, that um, you're also pointing out that there's other resources as well. Um, one thing I did want to um, say about the UVic Counseling Services is that, um, yes, there are counselors on campus, um, but they also have a list on their website. This is a but the last time I actually looked into this was a, it was about a year ago. So I was on there the other day. Okay, so there. Emma says it's still on there. Um, so there are a list of um, counselors um, that are uh, not they're associated with UVic, but they're not um, on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and they have awesome bios. Check them out um, because if you are going to the services at UVic and for whatever reason it's not working for you, whether you haven't really kind of 
ma- like kind of meshed with someone, one of the counselors, or you're maybe you're just like, you know what? Um, I don't want to see someone on campus because this isn't maybe a comfortable space for whatever reason for you. Um, check out the bios on the, the site. Um, see what their specializations are. Um, and, you know, if someone, um, you think that someone might be a good fit, like, check it out. If it doesn't work, uh, see if something else works or um, ask them who they would refer you to. And one important thing about that list is that it's, um, it's up there because those are counselors who offer student rates or sliding scale. Mm-hmm. So it is more affordable sometimes. And I think we'll include in the comment section uh, links to the different resources that mm-hmm. are available on campus as well as off campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another to actually be like, here you go, here's all of those things that we talked about. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I actually uh, did go to see one of those counselors that were, uh, I was referred by, to her by one of the doctors at UVix Health Services, but... Um, specifically for the purpose of uh, coming out and gender issues Mm -hmm. and um, basically figuring out how, if and how I wanted to transition, which for anyone listening who is not familiar with all the other writing I've done, uh, I'm currently on HRT and that went really well. Um, So yeah, glowing recommendation for the counselors that are available through those services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it definitely... uh, I, I don't know all the information about this, um, but uh, you can get some coverage. I believe it's up to like 80% that you can get covered. So mm-hmm. if you have, uh, okay, I can't do math. I'm in creative writing. <laughs> but uh, let's just say like on average with that list, if you get it 80% covered, you're probably looking at 15 to $20 that you will actually be paying out of your pocket. So mm-hmm. that is tremendously more reasonable than, you know, $80, $100 for one counseling appointment. So, um, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. It makes it way more accessible. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a super important thing to bring up because I know for a lot of listeners, they might be like, well, if I can't do this here at UVic, which is free, like, what am I supposed to do? I can't afford it. So the fact that there's this affordable, accessible thing out there for you is so good. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, with all of that being said, um, if you do find that you're struggling or that you're a little bit sad or anxious or just, or I mean, even if it's something bigger than that, uh, if you just feel like you need someone to talk to, that's totally normal. I mean, I think it, we've made it pretty clear throughout today's episode that this is a totally normal thing that affects basically everybody Mm -hmm. Um, and that also your mental health status is something that is really going to be changing a lot I mean you're gonna sometimes be like I'm just on top of the world and having such a good time and other times you're just gonna be like I am in a pit of despair (laughs) (laughs) Um, but your mental health what I really want to point out and what I kind of came to terms with is that your mental health does not define who you are as a person. So you are really more than that late night anxious brain rambling that goes on or those sudden bursts of tears that just seem to come out of nowhere that was triggered by like dropping your apple on the floor. Uh, So don't be afraid to speak up because it really is something that everyone experiences um and so like i said before we're gonna post all of the links to all of those resources up there uh so either if you just want and also another thing i wanted to say is that maybe you're not necessarily looking for resources for yourself but you're interested in improving some of the mental health resources that are in victoria and on campus Uh, Then I'm also going to post some links to some really cool organizations that you can work with and volunteer with because we didn't really talk that much about that tonight. Uh, But there's ways if you see, you know, people that are struggling, there's things that you can do to help them out. Uh, So now I'll just turn it over to the rest of the crew here uh, and let them say their final, their final thanks. Oh, I guess that's me. (laughs) Um, yeah, um, I think, you know, um, 
just take care of yourselves. Um, it's not always going to be sunshine and sunshine and rainbows. Um, but uh, if you need help, speak up. Um, if you're living in residence, there are community leaders, uh, friends, um, parents or guardians, counselors. Um, there are lots of resources. Um, sometimes it does feel overwhelming to uh, figure out where those people are, but um, taking those first steps are often really, really worth it to get the support you need. Yeah, I mean, that pretty much sums up I think everything, but coming from someone like I, I'm kind of just starting my mental health journey right now, and I've found it really helpful to just talk to my friends that I know have been through similar things and who can give me advice and reassure me that my problems aren't too small to go and talk to a counselor about because I know that that's something that it. A lot of people struggle with and that's a reason a lot of people don't go but there's never a wrong time for, and, and never a wrong reason for you to go and talk to somebody about something that's affecting you and yeah uh, I think like something Kate said really stuck for me basically you are not your mental illness mm -hmm. and sometimes it's good to have that reminder um, also uh, it's possible for you to have feelings that are really negative but they're still valid. It's possible for that to be true uh, for something at the same time. You can have a negative, destructive reaction that is still valid and deserving of attention, and it doesn't mean that you are any less deserving of love or of support. And on a completely different note, fuck Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, with that, <laughs> I guess that concludes this evening's podcast uh for today <laughs> so what i expected but no. hey <laughs> okay i mean i don't know tony if you want to elaborate on that or we're gonna need a new podcast that was, okay. <laughs> that so was just some self-care <laughs> stay tuned for next month's podcast fuck ho ho no fuck donald trump <laughs> can't wait to record that one <laughs> Woo! all right Ta-ta for now. <laughs>